All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's Google Search Central SEO Office Hours Hangouts. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I'm a search advocate on the search relations team here at Google in Switzerland. And part of what I do are these office hour hangouts, where people can join in and ask their questions around search. And we can try to find some answers. Um, a bunch of questions were submitted already on YouTube, so we can go through some of that. But uh, it looks like people are already raising their hands here. So maybe we can start with some live questions again. Cool. Let's see. Uh, Andrew, I think you're on top. Yeah, hello, John. Hello, Hi. everyone. Yes, I wanted to, to ask a question uh, regarding uh, the latest change uh, well, connected to generating titles. Uh, is it safe to think that uh, Google still rely on initial titles when uh, change it for ranking? Yes, yes. Uh, we it, At least that's, that's the way it is at the moment. So uh, you, you never know how these things evolve over time. Uh, but at least at the moment, it, it is the case that we continue to use what you have in your title tag, uh, in your title element, as something that we can use for, for ranking. It's not, it's not like something that replaces everything for the website, but it is a factor that we use in there. Even if uh, when we display the title for your page, we swap out maybe that one keyword that you care about, uh, we we would still use that for ranking. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's I, I think the the one thing the other question that that I always get around the titles is should I change my titles to be what Google has chosen because obviously mm -hmm. Google knows better and the answer is no. Uh, the, these are algorithms that are looking at things and trying to to figure things out. Uh, but you know your site best. You know your users best. So I would not blindly follow kind of what Google's algorithms are doing. Maybe there are cases where Google's algorithms give you good ideas, and that's fantastic. But I would not blindly follow that. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Cool. OK, um, Paul. Hi, I'm just asking about the link spam update. So we have a medical site, which links to another site to allow the customer to book the doctors, which is on a separate domain. How would you treat these links under the link spam update? Would you mark them as sponsored, or would, or uh, you know, we we own both domains, and uh, but they're different. So how would you treat these as a with the link? I I would just use normal links. I I think that's like a completely natural link uh, between mm -hmm. those two sites. That's kind of the the functionality, uh, if you will, part of the website. I, I would just use normal links for that. So, so it wouldn't be seen as like an affiliate link by Google because it's going from one domain to another with a UTM or something like that? No, no, that's, yeah. that's perfectly fine. Yeah. OK, OK, thank you. Sure. Uh, Patrick. Yeah, hi. Um, I have a question regarding uh, website migration. And um, currently, we are running a blog. and. Uh, Larger websites, both are running on separate domains. And we want to move the blog to the bigger website. But uh, since we don't want to change many things at once and risk our rankings, we would first adjust the current blog section and URL structure on the website and then integrate all the articles from the blog domain to the new website. Um, so is it better for the rankings to move all the blog content at once to the new domain after all the changes are done? Or should we maybe like move only a few articles once a month? Because my thought is that with the second approach, we won't really see like a big impact on the relaunch. And um, yeah, so what's, uh, what's a better approach? I, I, I think they can both be reasonable approaches. So it's not something where I would say you need to do it one way or the other. Um, in, in general, when, when it comes to website migrations, when you're moving from one domain to another, I, I think it makes sense to do it all at once if you can. Uh, but when you're kind of merging or splitting websites, then that's that kind of one, all at once uh, advice I, I don't think really applies. Uh, so especially when you're merging things together, when you're combining different websites, then doing that incrementally is perfectly fine. Doing that all at once is perfectly fine. Uh, there is no penalty, if you will, for moving too fast. 
uh, it's it's really more a matter of how how you can organize this on your side and how you can kind of handle that migration. Okay, thank you. Cool. Yeah. Good luck. I, I think always the these merging and splitting of websites it's always a bit tricky because it's hard to guess what the final outcome will be. But uh, yeah, good good luck. Hope it goes well. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Uh, Clive. Yes. Hi, John. Uh, we've got a Google News listed sports website, and we'd like to know what we can do to have our newsreels listed in the Google Carousel. Um, I, I don't have a lot of insight into the Google News side. So I, I can't give you that kind of like one, one simple answer. Uh, okay. we, we did do a blog post, I think maybe two months back or so, about Google News and kind of the, the whole inclusion process. Um, I, I would double check that. Uh, one of the things that has changed over the years is that it's moved much more to kind of an algorithmic inclusion process rather than a manual one. Uh, so in, in the early years, it was like you, you would kind of apply to get into Google News, and then you were accepted into Google News, and you were shown everywhere. And nowadays, it's more that you apply to get into the Google News Publisher Center, but that doesn't mean that you're automatically shown everywhere. Right. Uh, so kind of that step. That next step is something that's something where you kind of have to convince the algorithms that you're actually a, a fantastic news site. Uh, but uh, there's a bit more about that in, in the blog post. Excellent. OK, thank you. Sure. Uh, Giuseppe. Oh, we can't hear you. Uh, I don't think you're muted. It's... Just no sound. Hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, other, otherwise, I'll, I'll go to the next one and come back to you. Maybe, maybe there's a, a setting or something to kind of tweak. Or otherwise, maybe drop the question into the chat, and we can take a look at it there. OK, Stanley. Hello, John. Hi. Yeah, um, my question is specifically around structured markups for recipes. Um, the reason why I'm asking this question is because I'm seeing long form articles, for instance, listicles ranking for recipe carousels. And because those pages have been marked up as recipes, um, for instance, if you Google for things like easy lunch ideas, easy dinner ideas, you will see listicles being ranked under recipe carousels. So I was wondering if it's like websites trying to game the system or if it's a bug by Google or something yeah, along those lines. I, I think it's something along those lines. Um, so I, I saw your question in, in the, the YouTube <laughs> questions as well. Oh, yeah. we can hear Giuseppe. OK, we'll go back to you late in just a second. Um, and I, I took a look at some of those results. And that seems like something that we shouldn't be showing rich results for. So in particular, in the rich results guidelines, we, we do have uh, that it should be just one item on the page. And uh, it shouldn't be like a list of recipes uh, for you to use the recipe markup. Uh, so on, on the one hand, that's something where I think we could potentially take manual action with the web spam team on that. When we take manual action on rich results, usually that means we would just not show the rich results for those sites. Uh, but because it, at least the, the examples that you gave the, there seem like something where there are just a lot of websites that are doing this. I, I think the smarter approach would be on our side to see if we can algorithmically recognize this and uh, kind of just not show those rich results for those kind of pages. So instead of manually trying to chase everyone down, uh, find a way to do that in a more uh, scalable way. Thank you. That was actually my follow-up question. Cool. OK. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's always awkward to, to see these kind of examples where when you look at our guidelines and you look at the results, it's like, oh, this doesn't really match. And especially when there are a lot of sites like this. But uh, this is the kind of feedback that is very useful for the folks that work on the algorithms. Cool. OK. Giuseppe, back to you. 
Okay, thank you. It, now it's uh, fine? Can Perfect. You me? Yeah, okay, yes. thanks. So a question about mobile-friendly uh, criteria in, in the Google Search Console. And we have our inform, information sites uh, with, uh, let's say, about uh, 1,400 pages, no? about product specification, reviews, and, and so on. And the first strange thing is that only the 20% the of these pages uh, are listed in the valid mobile usability list no you know uh, even if the structure of the pages are more or less the same because the the, the structure is the same of course it changes the product uh, uh, to be described and in the review so this is first strange but even more strange since 10 days ago i saw a, a major drop about 40 percent in the number of the url that are listed as mobile valid no and without any any site restructure so what i what i did i took the the list of 10 days ago and took the list uh, yesterday i compared the list the the list from yesterday is much much shorter and i picked up uh, some url that are no more appearing as valid no uh, so they were valid 10 days ago they are no more valid and I used the search uh, check uh, URL tool in the search console, and uh, the search tool says they are mobile optimized, so they are fine. And so, uh, what, what's happening? <laughs> what to look at? Thanks. Yeah, I I agree. This is kind of confusing. Um, what what is happening there is in Search Console for these kind of aggregate reports, we show a sample of the URLs from your website, and uh, that's that's what we report on there. And uh, that doesn't mean that we we ignore the mm. other URLs from your website or that uh, they're they're bad in any way. It doesn't mean that they're not mobile friendly. It's just that we we didn't check them. So essentially, you, you can think of it a little bit like you have 1,000 URLs on your website, and we will double check 200 of them uh, for, for mobile friendliness. And that number 200, that can change over time. So it can happen that maybe one time we only check 100 URLs to see if they're mobile friendly. Uh, that means the, the total mobile friendly count can go down, but that doesn't mean that the number of pages that are mobile friendly on your website go down. So in, in short, what you need to look for there is more the number of errors and kind of the proportion of normal pages to errors uh, that we report in, in Search Console for, for those reports. So this is, I think, specific for mobile friendly, for the different structured data reports, also for the AMP report. And in, in a different way for the, the core web vitals as well. Uh, so it's not a sign that these are not kind of well, well made for mobile friendliness. It's just that we didn't check them. OK. And if, if I can, just a very small uh, addition, because the, the only thing we were trying to do uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks is uh, about uh, using structured data markup, you know, about the product. But since this is a, 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 an informative uh, uh, information site, so with aggregation of information, uh, uh, I know that Google prescribes that to, to include the, the product markup, you need at least uh, to include either uh, reviews or aggregate rating or offers. Well, one of the three at least, otherwise the structure that is not valid. No, and but I know that about reviews, you cannot link put links. Uh, to uh, third-party sites, so the reviews must be on the current sites. Uh, and, and the question is about offers. I mean, is it uh, allowed to include the links uh, to other sellers, like affiliate links, uh, Amazon links, or you have to sell the product uh, in the specific site to be valid? Yeah. I, I think it should be fine to, to include links to, to other sources like that. Um, because it's it's also something that uh, some, sometimes sites are, are just set up this way, that they're affiliate sites. Sometimes they're set up in a way that the, the shopping cart system is on a separate site. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I haven't explicitly asked the team about, uh, about this. But from, from my point of view, that, that seems OK. That seems unproblematic. OK, thanks. Sure. Uh, Daniel, 
Hey, John. Hey. <clears throat> Just a couple of quick questions, actually. Um, first one, category pages. Uh, content at the top or the bottom of the page, um, especially where you've got, say, quite a lot of products. Um, having content at the top or the bottom page, will it make a difference to ranking? Um, a little bit of content, I think, is always useful. But uh, it's not the case that you need to turn it into kind of an, an article about that kind of content. Uh, so a little bit of content is useful in the sense that we have a little bit more context of the, the articles that you're listing there. Uh, so that, that always makes a little bit of sense. And that's something that we saw as being problematic in the early days of mobile-first indexing, for example, uh, where mm -hmm. on desktop you would have some context about uh, kind of the type of products that you have in a category page. And on mobile, you often just have a list of products. And uh, in, in the early days of mobile-first indexing, that was a bit of an issue. Uh, but I, I think that has settled down. What, what I would try to avoid is making it so that you have like a Wikipedia article on the bottom of your pages. And yeah. really kind of it, it's something where you can provide a little bit of context, but you don't need to rank for every keyword in the galaxy uh, with these kind of category pages, because it, I think it just dilutes your, the overall view of those pages. Uh, because we we try to find them, on the one hand, for people looking for that category of products, but also to find links to the individual products. So it's kind of like yeah. a little bit is good, but overdoing it doesn't really make sense. Because we've got different, you know, we've got different examples where we'll have like a little bit of content at the top of the page and the rest at the bottom, or it's in a read more functionality and. And generally, you know, in, in the past, if we've seen rankings drop, then thought, okay, well, maybe if we put the content at the top of the page, because they're associating the relevance more now, and they say going top to bottom. So, do, will it not make a difference then? I mean, because from what you're saying in terms of conversion rate, you know, it, it's obviously you don't want the content to be putting all the products down. But I think in terms of relevance, would you associate more relevance if the content was at the top or the bottom? Do you think or top or bottom? I Without all these random, I would say random products, but there's loads of different products, so you could have loads of different H ones and, and all that yeah. stuff being pulled. Through. I I don't think there would be a big difference. My my hunch would be that probably having the the context at the top makes it a little bit easier for us to pick up, and mm -hmm. uh, also things like understanding the headings and and things like that with regards to a page probably makes it a little bit easier. But I don't know if there would be a measurable difference. OK, cool. My um, second question, obviously, with all this stuff going on with title tags now, are there any instances where you wouldn't use a title tag in the waiting, i.e., if it's too long, as an example? I don't think so. No. I you just can use it every time. Yeah. I mean, it's. I, I think with titles, you should see it a little bit like headings in the sense that if everything is a, in the title tag, then essentially the, the value of each individual item is very small. Uh, yeah. So it's it's kind of like you should focus a little bit about what, what this page is really about and not just blindly stuff keywords in there. Yeah. Uh, because at some point, it'll be like the value of the title tag is, I don't know, let's say two, and you have 200 words in there, then the value of each word is very small. Uh, mm -hmm. So you you kind of need to find that balance and almost treat, still treat them as something like, well, if users see this, would it encourage them to click through, or does it just look like you're just throwing keywords out there? Yeah, yeah. Would it make it doesn't make any difference if you were to have say the country you're targeting. Obviously, if in touch SEO, if you had the US in the title tag versus if you had the UK in the title tag, would that be considered at all? I, I don't think we would use that for geo-targeting. OK. That's, that's actually really good to, to know. Cool. That was it. Cool. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, Polina. Hi, John. Hi, everyone. So uh, I posted a couple of questions uh, on the community tab already. And so um, first question is a quick one. For Core Web Vitals data, does data from web, web view pages uh, count towards it? I don't know. I, I tried to look it up, but I couldn't find anything there. there. There's some criteria for 
uh, Core Web Vitals. So, so basically, you you would need to look up the uh, Chrome User Experience Report data. Mm -hmm. And uh, on web.dev, they have some documentation on what the requirements are for that data to be collected. Um, I, I don't know if the, the web view would count into that. Um, what I would do is try to pull out that article and uh, just ping the author of the article on Twitter and ask them directly. OK, great, thanks. So, so you also wouldn't know uh, if the web view performance is included um, as a ranking factor for page experience signals, right? I mean, if it's, if it's included in the Chrome user experience report, then it would be included. But uh, okay. that's something where it's, I, I don't know if that's uh, taken into account for the Chrome user experience report data, uh, because we, we really need to be sure that people are opting in to um, kind of giving this data to Google. And I don't know if with a web view, there is kind of this notion of even opting in or being able to opt in. Right, thank you. And another question is maybe something a bit too complicated for you to give me much help, but um, I'd like some ideas. So basically, we have a, a huge problem on one of uh, our e-commerce websites we look at. Um, on listing pages, the JavaScript that's responsible for uh, loading all the listing products, uh, it Google bot cannot access it, cannot render it apparently according to mobile friendly test tool and search console uh, so we get like zero products um robots text doesn't block it uh, we check server logs they say that google bot isn't blocked and it can access the resources other parts of the page are absolutely fine other javascript on the website's fine um, another absolutely identical website we have uh, which is in a different country it's also fine um, it doesn't have this issue. And the issue just resolved itself for like one month when developers didn't change anything and the server folks also didn't change anything. So we have no idea what's happening and I don't really know where else to look. So if you have any ideas. Um, is, is this something that you only see in the testing tools or is it something that you also see in the search results? Uh, we see these pages being seen as duplicate, for example, or in, uh, we see less indexing that we uh, expect. So I, I think it's actually not rendered correctly. OK. I mean, what, what I would double check is to see if, if it can actually be rendered for search first. And I, I think one way you could do that potentially is to do a site query for mm -hmm. those specific pages. Mm -hmm. and some of the keywords that are only added with JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of double check the, the assumption that it's really like not being taken into account by Google. Uh, because especially with the, the testing tools that we have, we, we set them up in a way that uh, they have much stricter deadlines with regards to how quickly a server should respond, uh, because we want to give you a result as quickly as possible. And when it comes to search, we, we don't have those kind of deadlines because we can say, well, we will just kind of like take time to cache these scripts and then execute them separately. Uh, we don't have to do it all within a couple of seconds. So it, it can certainly happen that a testing tool will say it didn't work, but actually in search, it did work. Uh, so I, I kind of watch out for that. But, um, Usually, also, when, when this happens, it can be a sign that things are kind of on the edge in the sense that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, I, I think, is still something worth trying to figure out. Um, what, what I would do, especially if this is a JavaScript site, I would join one of Martin's sessions. Uh, he, he does office hours specifically for JavaScript-based websites and uh, maybe submit one of those URLs to, to his uh, question and answers ahead of time so that he can take a look and uh, get his input on that. Because it might be that there's something small that you can do to improve kind of uh, the, the whole process there. It might be that when he looks at it, he says, oh, it's, it's a non-issue. It's the testing tool that is confusing you. Um, but that's, that's kind of the direction I, I would take there. So, I, I would first check if it's really a critical issue, and then also check in with Martin to see if it's maybe something on the edge, where sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. 
Okay, thank you. So uh, just uh, quickly to check, because uh, we did see what, when the issue self-resolved itself, the indexes went up. And then when it went back, it they dropped. Um, mm -hmm. So assuming there the issue exists, uh, what do you think is, uh, what are some of the big reasons when Google cannot access JavaScript aside from uh, being blocked with robots text or being blocked by servers? Yeah, so I, I think probably what what is the what what happens the most there is uh, that it's more of a general rendering speed issue in the sense that uh, maybe maybe you have something set up that uh, the JavaScript or the API responses are um, created in the way that they almost have session IDs associated with them so that we can't cache them properly. Uh, or anything where essentially rendering the page takes a significant amount of resources extra. So what, what I've done in the past uh, when, when looking in these kind of issues is to look at webpagetest.org or in Chrome at the waterfall kind of diagram there to see is this is this a page that has a significant amount of JavaScript and other content that needs to be loaded, or is it something where maybe there are just like 50 requests in total, and uh, it's may maybe a, a slightly different question then. But um, at least in the cases I've looked at, it, it is more something where there are almost like hundreds or 200, 300, 400, 500 requests that are required to render a page. And when you have that many in place, even if we cache a lot of those uh, requests, it's, it can be a bit hit and miss if the timing works out that we can actually complete all of those requests in time for rendering. Thank you very much. That helps. Cool. All right. Um, Mustafa. Hello, John. Hi, everyone. Oh, wait, wait a second. I, I think someone else was in between, but uh, somehow they dropped out. Uh, what, what, I think was yeah. that you go travel. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. Sorry. Hi. Sorry. I'll get back to you, Mustafa. Okay. No problem. No, no problem. Thank you. Uh, good morning, John. We have just uh, one question regarding to the titles. We built up a strategy for the meta title, and uh, some weeks ago, Google changed it. As already we know. But uh, the main issue is for us that our, only our brand name was changed. So nothing changed, only our brand name. It was uh, appeared uppercase in the last time, but now it's, uh, it was replaced by domain. And uh, my question is, is it possible to ask for the change of it, or uh, we should accept it? Um, I, I would submit it to the, the help forum thread. I, I think you already did. Is, is it possible? I, I thought I saw it there as well. Uh, but anyway, in, in the help forum, we, we have a thread with feedback for, for these kind of issues. And the, the team that is working on titles is actively monitoring that and trying to figure out what kind of bigger issues there are. So they wouldn't be able to go in and say, for individual websites, we will change the titles uh, based on the feedback. Uh, but they do try to recognize the general type of problem and then try to fix that algorithmically. So my, my understanding is that what, what will probably happen is we'll have a number of smaller updates in these algorithms over time. I, I don't know how quickly, maybe, maybe in the next couple of weeks. And uh, things will get better. And uh, we'll see kind of how things settle down. And it might be that this already fixes the issue that you're seeing. Uh, but if not, then, then feel free to, to make sure that it's, it's known to us. OK, OK, thank you. Thanks. Cool. OK, and Mustafa. Hi, everyone again. Um, I'd like to ask you, John, please, about um, a manual action that we received that it's a bit confusing. Um, the description says, job posting markup used on expired job without the valid through property set in the past. So basically, it says that the job post is expired. However, our structured data says that it's still valid. The issue is when, when I check the job post, it's a user-generated content. So when I check the job post, I found that it's, it's not expired. It's relatively new. And there's nothing on the page indicates that it's expired. So I don't want to respond to it, you know, in a defensive way that, yeah, hey, guys, that there's some error, human error or something, but I'd like to do it the correct way. So what do you think that I should do? Um, I, I would 
double check to see if you can find maybe a, a bigger pattern there. Because usually with, with manual, manual actions, we give some example URLs when we can, but uh, we only do the manual action when we think that this is something that is more widespread across the website. So the, the URLs that we give usually are more examples and not a complete list. Of, of the problem. So I I mean, it's it's something where you can definitely respond to the manual action and say, I think you got it wrong. Because if it's a, a manual action, sometimes maybe we do get it wrong. Uh, but I, I would also check if, if there's a way to, to check across your website to see if, I don't know, this expired uh, job listing issue is something that is maybe uh, a, a potential issue on other listings as well, uh, just to double check that uh, it's it's really not just this one page that that is kind of like uh, a problem, but rather that there's actually no broader mm. issue on your website. Yeah, what I say that it's most likely only against that single page because the uh, traffic that comes organically from Google is rising. As a matter of fact, yesterday we received the highest number of clicks ever from Google Organic. So I guess that that's something related to the page itself, but it's good note, yeah. We can look at it. Uh, to be honest, user-generated content is really difficult to, to control. I think some... Yeah, manual checks from our side should be applied. OK, uh, we'll see this. But do you think, in general, it's OK to say that maybe you got it wrong? I, I mean, it, it happens. I, I would first right. check your website to, to make sure, uh, because kind of this back and forth, if they come back and say, oh, no, we double checked, and it's actually a bigger problem, uh, then, then, then you're just problem. <laughs> kind of like yeah. deferring kind of the, the time that you need. Sure. Uh, but sure. Uh, if if when you double check you see oh it's it actually looks okay or maybe there's something confusing on your pages where you can tell them it's like maybe you were confused or maybe users are confused uh, that's that's also something that might be useful feedback for the manual action folks. I see. So suppose that some manual action comes, you know, in relation to some spammy content. That's what we fear always because it's a user generated content. Would it be acceptable to say that, yeah, it was a spammy content, for example, by, posted by the user. We're going to apply some checks ourselves. But you know, that doesn't yeah. guarantee 100%. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's, that's perfectly fine. With user-generated content, it's always a bit tricky. But if you can explain to the manual action team that we, you took action on the examples they gave, you improved your processes to make sure that it doesn't happen in the future. That's kind of what they're looking for. Sure. Yeah, but there's still a slight chance that something wrong might happen in the future. No, no. I mean, yeah. it's, it's always something where with user-generated content, you can improve your processes, of but course, yeah. uh, you, you never know what, what they will do yeah. next. Yeah. So the team would understand that yeah. uh, it's a bit tricky. Right. OK, that's clear. Thank you very much. Cool. OK, and I have been avoiding the submitted questions. So if you submitted something, sorry. Uh, I'll go through some of these now, and uh, we can do more live questions later on, or maybe after the recording stops as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, Search Console shows a page on a specific position in the search results. When I look it up, it doesn't show on that position. Um, so this is something that, that is super common, and it's Sometimes a bit confusing, especially in the beginning when you see that. Uh, but the, the data in Search Console is based on what users actually see in the search results. So it's not a theoretical number for the position. It's what, what was actually seen. And uh, that means that if when you check those pages and you see something different, then maybe users just saw something different that, than what you saw. So, Sometimes what happens is we show an image from a page, and then we show the position very high in Search Console. And when you look at it, maybe you don't notice that this image is from your website, or maybe you don't see any images in the search result. Uh, so that can be a difference there. Uh, but also, with different countries, there are slightly different rankings. With different language settings, there are slightly different rankings. With different device types, there can be different rankings. There are lots of things that kind of play into the rankings. And 
uh, a lot of that just means that you can't always confirm one to one exactly what is shown in Search Console. Uh, usually, if, if I see something really weird, what I do is try to drill down in very specific settings in Search Console to see, oh, from this country, this language, uh, this kind of search, uh, this kind of device, they saw this thing. And then I can try to reproduce that. But it's still not always 100% sure. And these things also change over time. So it can happen that you see something in Search Console that happened yesterday or the day before. And when you look at it, it's different because it has changed. Uh, so there is not much uh, that, that we can do to kind of say, like, it should always be the same. But rather, it's just, well, that's how we recorded it. And how when you look at it, it might be different. Can I just ask, sorry, um, on that, it, with impressions, um, if it's just something new, do, does the user physically have to see the URL for that impression to get counted? Or does a page page just have to load with you there? Like it it has to there? load with, with it there, yeah. Yeah, but they so, won't really use it necessarily see it as an impression. Yeah, it, so if it's on the bottom of the search results page, that, that would still count. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the one place where it's slightly different is when there's a carousel of results, uh, such as like with the top stories or with, I think, images. I don't know. Um, if, if it's kind of like off to the side for the carousel, then we would only count that when it's loaded into the viewport, actually. Right, OK. OK, yeah. cool. I thought I'd just ask on that. And is it a sample of the data, or is it 100% of the data? It, it depends. So we, we track a, a certain number of um, entries per site per day. And uh, for, for most websites, that's kind of like enough to track everything. And uh, for some websites, it's, it's something where, where we do have to kind of do some amount of sampling there. OK, thanks. Um, then title tags. Uh, if Google is changing display titles to other HTML elements, uh, but that doesn't impact rankings, does that mean that the weight of the title tags as a ranking factor will eventually decrease? Um, I mean, eventually, like who knows what will actually happen in, in the long run. So I, I can't promise that nothing will change there. In fact, almost certainly it will, will change at some point. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think there are any plans to kind of decrease the weight of title tags overall. Um, maybe that's something that, that happens over time, but uh, at least not at, at the moment and not with this specific title tag change. Uh, does Google look at my other websites in Search Console to give a quality score uh, to a certain website? Or are all websites separate from each other? No, I, I don't think we look at other websites in your Search Console account. Uh, on the one hand, this would be really tricky because there are lots of agencies that work on a wide variety of websites. And uh, just because they're in one account doesn't really mean that much. Uh, so essentially, I, I would assume they're all treated as separate websites. Um, looking at rebranding, moving domains, um, most of the content, CMS, and the website structure will remain the same. The main concern is we're going from a .com domain to a .co.uk. Uh, majority of our customers are based in the UK, uh, but we get traffic from all over the world. Uh, is, it, is that a problem, like going to .com and uh, .co.uk instead of .com? Um, from our point of view, that's that's perfectly fine. So with a .co.uk uh, domain, you are essentially automatically geo-targeting the UK. Um, but it can be a global website. So the one thing that you can't do with a .co.uk uh, domain is to create a separate section of your website, like a separate subdomain, and say, this is for a different country. Uh, so if you had maybe, I don't know, a, a version of your site for Australia or for I don't know, some other country, and you called it australia.yoursite.co.uk, you would not be able to do geotargeting for that part of your website. Uh, because essentially, we say everything on this domain is already geotargeted to the UK. Uh, so that's kind of the, the one thing to watch out for. I, I would imagine that you would see 
traffic fluctuations for a while when moving like this, because just because of the matter of like going from a generic domain to a country code specific domain, or even the other way around sometimes, um, it, it takes a bit of time for things to settle down. And I, I would definitely expect fluctuations when you say it's like most of the content will remain the same. Because if most of the content remains the same, that means that there are some changes. And when there are kind of content changes and domain changes, and you're moving uh, kind of across this geo-targeting, non-geo-targeting border, uh, I would definitely expect some changes there. Uh, with regards to should you use the .com instead of the .co.uk, I, I think from an SEO point of view, there's probably no reason, unless you plan on targeting other countries with that same domain. Um, but maybe there, there are reasons from from marketing point of view or kind of like general engaging with users point of view. Um, the, from, from an SEO point of view, if you want to target other countries, the approach you would have to take with a .co.uk domain is to essentially use a different domain name for the other countries. So you would have australia-yourwebsite.com or .com.au uh, instead of uh, your subdomain side. But that's, that's also doable. Uh, what are your thoughts on large sites splitting into multiple CMSs? Any concerns or anything to watch out for? Uh, we, we don't do anything special with CMSs. We, we, we do understand that they exist. And we, I think we track them uh, in the sense uh, that uh, in, what is it, uh, HTTP archive, there's, there's kind of a, a CMS classification thing there. But that's more a matter of kind of like having metrics on what, what is happening on the web and not something that we would take into account for ranking or for indexing. Uh, so essentially, having multiple CMSs on the same website is perfectly fine. Uh, the, the things that you would watch out for with CMSs in general, they, they apply there as well. So if you have a CMS that creates kind of crufty URLs, then that's something you would need to fix. But that's something you would need to fix anyway if you use that CMS. It's not different just because you have multiple of these on the same site. Uh, my website is a download site, and I update the post quite a bit. Sometimes I get uh, Search Console warnings with unusual downloads or harmful downloads, uh, even though I test every file I upload. Um, these tend not to have any example URLs, so it's, it's very hard to kind of figure out what, what should be done there. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what, what the best approach is here. Uh, so. The, the thing I would watch out for here is, um, first of all, to make sure that you're not systematically generating new download files on your own. Um, because I, I think, what is it, uh, unusual download or something, uncommon download is, is the warning that we show. Uh, that's something we show in Search Console and in, in the browser when we see that a user is downloading something that looks like it might be an uninstallable uh, that we haven't seen before, or that we've rarely, rarely seen before, that we haven't been able to check before. Uh, and uh, that's something that can happen if you tag your downloads. Uh, for example, if, if people sign up and you include that sign up information in the download file itself, uh, then the download will be unique for every user. And that means that we won't be able to kind of scan them proactively. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the thing that you would need to watch out for if you're creating kind of a download site. So ideally, make sure that you're passing on kind of the original download and not something that you're putting together yourself. Uh, because that way we can kind of understand, oh, this is, this is a file we've seen before. We know this is safe. We don't have to do anything with this. Uh, from, from a site owner point of view, if you're seeing this occasionally, uh, you can always use the Request Review button in Search Console, especially for these kind of files, because uh, what will happen there is our systems will then go off and actually double check those files. And they will let you know if there's something 
actually problematic with those files, and they will give you the URLs then. Uh, so that's kind of like, on the one hand, try to avoid the situation where you create unique downloads. On the other hand, it's fine to request review if there are no examples and you need some more examples. Um, PPC versus SEO landing pages. Our site has one URL that we use for PPC and uh, SEO purposes. We'd like to split this into two URLs. Um, however, both PPC and SEO teams want to keep the original URL. Uh, so I think the question is kind of like, so who, who gets to keep the URL? Uh, which is more important, PPC or SEO? Um, I, so just from, from a personal point of view, I, I think the SEO side is something where it probably makes more sense to keep the original URL uh, because there's just a lot more tied in with regards to the performance uh, for that specific URL. So I think on both sides, there is a matter of kind of like tracking. You don't want to change your tracking. You don't want to change things like that. Uh, but uh, on the SEO side, if you were to create a new URL, uh, you essentially wouldn't be able to redirect from the old URL because people want to reuse that. Uh, so essentially, you would be starting off with a completely fresh page rather than kind of starting off with that state of whatever you've done so far kind of gets passed on. Uh, so from that point of view, I would suggest to keep the original URL for SEO and uh, create something separate for, for the PPC side for tracking. However, I don't know how the PPC side does things like uh, kind of like tracking the quality of URLs and if, if that would also play a role and if like both sides want to keep the history of the domain of the URL. Uh, so that's, I don't know. I, I don't know everything there. Uh, is structured data penalty a thing and enforced? I think we looked at this before. Um, Google News, we looked at that. Um, the web view page, we looked at that. Uh, we're facing an issue when trying to call the Search Console API using a service account authorization. Um, I, I looked at this question briefly beforehand, but uh, I, I don't know all of the details here. And it looks like you posted in the help forum, so I think that would probably be the best place there. Um, I, I will send someone from, from the Search Console side also to double check uh, the thread in the help forum to see if there is something that we, we can add there. Um, yeah, let's see. Question about a site link. I have a global e commerce site. Uh, recently, Google started showing other countries in the site link in the search result. Uh, for example, a UK website uh, search result is included in the Australian site link. Um, I use hreflang properly. Uh, Google used to have a site link demotion tool, uh, but that's gone now. How do I fix this? Yeah, I, I think the tool has been gone for a really long time now. And uh, the, the main reason we kind of dropped that tool is because from our point of view, site links are essentially normal links on a page that we would show in the search results nowadays. And it's less a matter that there's something kind of unique about the site links. So that's something where um, if, if you're seeing something like the, the cross language or cross country versions in the site link file, in the site link results, that usually points at something where something with geotargeting or with hreflang is not working out properly. Uh, so I would double check some of that just to make sure that uh, the, the hreflang setup is really working properly. And if, if when you check that, you see that everything is set up properly on your website and Google is just confusing everyone by showing a different language in the site link, uh, then send me some examples. Send me some screenshots and some sample queries that I can do. And then I can pass that on to the team that works on kind of the uh, international results. And we can see if we can find something in our algorithms that we need to improve there. Um, can we use the google.com KG MID? Uh, essentially kind of a, a specific URL for, for knowledge graph entities, I think, as the schema.org uh, same as property. Um, 
As far as I know, you can do this. I don't know if it's a good idea, though, because essentially the, the knowledge graph uh, ID that we have on our side, it could change over time. And uh, when you're looking at something like the, the same as property in structured data, you really want to provide something that is stable, uh, something that always remains the same so that over time, we can kind of associate more and more things with that. And if you assign something that is generated by Google, which theoretically could change over time, then that feels a bit, I don't know, brittle. And it feels like something that could break over time. So I, as, as far as I know, I, I would try to avoid doing that and instead do something like uh, pointing at your contact page or your website homepage or a Wikipedia article about your company or anything like that, which is something that is more, more stable than the, the knowledge graph ID. And is it necessary for a new website to submit a sitemap file? Uh, it's not necessary to submit a sitemap file, especially if you're a very small and new website. Um, however, it does make it easier for us to recognize where there is new and updated content. Uh, so I would definitely recommend doing that, if, especially if you're starting out, especially if you're using a common CMS, where making a sitemap file is often just a matter of a check mark. Uh, so I, I would definitely do it. It's not a requirement, but it's, it's a good practice. Cool. OK. We're kind of running into the end of time uh, of, the, of the session. So maybe I'll just get some more live questions. And I have a bit more time afterwards as well uh, where we can extend a bit. Uh, let's see. Tim. Hi, John. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, just to, so, so we're seeing a slow decline in uh, mobile-friendly pages in the mobile usability report in Search Console. Um, we're also seeing like a decline in in pages in that are in the Core Web Vitals report, and also other enhancements like review snippets and and all of this type of stuff. Um, these are all product pages I've noticed, and over the span of maybe a month or a month and a half, there's about a thousand pages. Um, I'd just like to know like, what would be, where I should be looking. Is this a crawling issue potentially? Like where should I be looking here? Like they're not coming up as errors or anything. They're just simply dropping out of that report. Yeah, I, I think we, we had pretty much the same question right at the beginning, but uh, it's, Essentially, what, what is happening is uh, for these reports, we look at a sample of the URLs from your website. So uh, it's, it's something where having fewer URLs in these reports doesn't mean that the other URLs are bad or problematic. It's just we, we didn't check them. Uh, so especially for the aggregate reports, uh, which is for, for the Core Web Vitals to some extent, uh, the AMP report, the structured data reports, uh, mobile friendliness, I, I think, as well. Uh, for those reports, we, we only take a look at a sample of the, the things. And uh, that sample can change over time. So it can happen that we look at 200 URLs from your site, I don't know, now. And then maybe in a month or two, we'll look at 100 URLs from your website. And that doesn't mean that the kind of the difference is bad. It's just we, we looked at a smaller sample of the URLs from your website. So usually what you would do with these reports is look more at the, the relationship between the bad pages reported there and the good ones. Uh, if these are all reported as, as being OK without any errors, then that means all of the URLs we checked from your site, they're OK. So, from that point of view, that's fine. If, on the other hand, you see that the proportion of errors rises over time, then that's kind of a sign that something is problematic that you might want to take a look at. But the absolute number of URLs that we show there, that's not something that you need to take any action on. OK. Yeah, sorry about asking the same question. I, I oh, joined no maybe 10 minutes late. Sorry about that. No problem. That. No problem. Um, 
so so just on okay well that pretty much answers my second question as well so uh, thanks for that cheers cool okay um all right uh let me take a break here and pause the recording and there's still some hands raised so we can get uh to you all later as well uh, to anyone watching this recording, thank you for watching. If you'd like to join these in the future, feel free to, to jump on in. Uh, we post them in the calendar on the Google Search Central site, as well as in the community section in, on our YouTube channel. So feel free to drop questions in there. If uh, I didn't get to yours, uh, feel free to go to the help forum as well. Lots of experts are there who are able to help and maybe see you in one of the future episodes. All right, and with that, I'll pause the recording.